nothingbuncakes.com. It's murder, mystery, and mayhem at the Canyon Theater Guild. Usher in the new year with laughter and mystery at the hilarious comedy whodunit Clue on Stage. Was it Miss Scarlet in the kitchen with the wrench? Perhaps it was Mr. Green in the billiard room with the rope. Only one way to find out. Based on the popular board game and adapted from the cult classic film, Clue on Stage will keep audiences guessing and laughing to the very end. Get your tickets by calling 661-799-2702 or online at canyontheater.org. Healthcare can be difficult if you're underinsured or have Medi-Cal. Samuel Dixon Family Health Center can help. Services are available on a sliding fee schedule. The mission of the Samuel Dixon Family Health Center is to give the Santa Clarita Valley access to affordable, quality primary care. There are three locations to serve you, Canyon Country, Newhall, and Valverde. Go to sdfhc.org for more information and to find the location most convenient for you. Hometown. <laughs> All day long, constantly. Your hometown station, 98.1 FM and AM 1220. Hello, welcome back to KHTS Radio. This is KHTS Co-News Director Jade Abishan, and I am joined today by a couple of very special guests. I am joined by the family of Scott Murphy, who is a three-year-old boy who was unfortunately the victim of a brutal murder in 1972 alongside another three-year-old, Adrian Greenwood, and Adrian's mother, Linda. They were killed in their own home right over here in Valencia. And I am joined today by Steve and Karen Murphy. How are you guys doing today? Good under the circumstances. Thank you. How are you doing, Karen? <laughs> I'm doing good. Thank you. Good. Thank you guys so much for joining us. I know this isn't easy, especially considering the fact that as I was just talking with Steve, I found out that some of this information is very new to you. So I understand that this is fresh. That's some the- of it is, yes. Yeah, that's, uh, thankfully, I haven't had much of a chance to interact with the families of murder victims too often. It has happened, but something I've learned is that there's always something new. As long as the grieving process takes, there's always something that manages to break in there, and thank you for doing this. Thank you for having us on. All right, so the reason we are talking today is because the convicted killer in this case, who was a 17-year-old at the time, Robert Allen Murphy, I'm sorry, Robert Allen Grigsby, not that, is currently up for parole once again in March. So let me just give you guys a little bit of an overview of the case. On Monday, November 27th, 1972, so right after Thanksgiving weekend, the three victims, Linda Greenwood and three-year-old Adrian Greenwood and three-year-old Scott Murphy, were each found in the bedroom of the Greenwood home on the 25,000 block of Avenida Rotella in Valencia, For those of you who are kind of familiar with the area, that's right over by Old Orchard Park, just to the west of Orchard Village. And it was actually on that day itself that your stepmother, I believe, yes? My mother. Your mother, Karen's stepmother, actually encountered the killer, Robert Grigsby, after the murder and was attacked herself but managed to escape and actually helped lead to his identification. So how old were each of you at the time of the murders? Karen, why don't you start? Okay, I was 14 um, at the time of the murder and in Texas at the time of the murder. Okay. How about you, Steve? I was 11, and uh, I was in school when it happened. And my father came to get my brother and I right after he found out. Wow. Tell me, <clears throat> tell me about your brother. He was... He was three. They've got such vibrant personalities at that time. What do you guys remember about him? Go ahead, Karen. Okay. Um, he was a baby the last time that I was with him. We, we actually lived in California a little over six months after Scotty was born and went to school there. My sisters and I did. Um, and then we moved back home. So I was around Scotty mainly, you know, those, I don't know, I think he was a couple of months old till seven or eight months old, something like that. And then had, I think I only saw him one other time um, after that. And he was gone. Wow. Let me use Steve. Um, he was a, a very gentle, fun-loving three-year-old. I mean, um, you know, he 
didn't have a mean bone in his body, for lack of a better expression. Yeah, I, you actually sent me a picture right before we were going into this, and he seems like such a sweet little boy with the blonde hair. And reading through the old news articles on this, I was hearing that he actually tricycled down to your neighbor's house all by himself to play right. with his friend. Right. Mm -hmm. The big wheel. The big <laughs> wheel. <laughs> so, so for you, Steve, you found out when your dad came to get you and your other brother out of school. How did that day go for you? Oh, Wow. Um, you know, I was called into the principal's office. Uh, my father and my brother were there with the principal and, um, you know, my father broke the news to my brother and I, and then we left. He took us home, which was, you know, a one minute ride from the school there at Old Orchard to where we lived. We just lived about five houses down from where the murder occurred and or murders. And, um, you know, it, my mom was up in her bedroom with the door closed and uh, my aunt and a few other relatives were already there at the house. And um, I mean, the, the, the one thing that's very vivid to me is I didn't see my mom hardly at all for several weeks because she was, um, you know, in the bedroom, uh, probably under some, you know, some t had was sedative sedatives, and um, I think the only time that I can remember seeing my mom over the next several weeks was when uh, she and my my father went to the funeral. Which uh, you were telling me earlier that, that you did not attend the funeral. No. Um, my brother and I were not allowed to go to the funeral. I, I none of us did. No, none of the, none of the, none of the children. Uh, no, we no. wanted to. My, my sisters and I wanted to, and none of us did. None of us were allowed to go. Well, Karen, you were in a different state entirely, so obviously I had to filter through a couple of different avenues before you found out. What was your experience? No. Not really. Um, my Aunt Kay, which is uh, my dad's sister-in-law, she's married to my, uh, my dad's a twin. And my, my, his twin brother was Rodney, married to Kay. And she was there at um, the house in California and called my mother in Texas because this was going to make national news. Mm -hmm. And they needed us to know before we're sitting in front of a TV seeing national news and finding out. So we were pulled out of school as well. Um, I was in my science class, and I was the last one that my mother picked up, and we went to my grandparents' house. And she wouldn't tell us what was going on until we got to my grandparents' house. And at that time, my aunt and uncle had pulled my three cousins out of school as well. And um, we were all there at the house whenever I was my sisters and I were told, and I mean, we just huddled together and, and cried and grieved and asked why, I, how I, could this be? I was telling Karen, um, she didn't know this, but we were, we were on the phone the other day and I can, you know, I, I remember, uh, Connie Chung at the time was one of the local, uh, newscasters. And I remember her, coming uh, up to the front steps where my brother and I were sitting along with a couple of my cousins and my Aunt Kay that Karen was talking about was, was there with us. And, you know, she politely asked if she could interview anyone in the family and looked at us and my aunt said, you know, that no one would be giving any interviews. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, I, uh, reading up on this case has been incredibly uncomfortable for multiple reasons. Obviously, not only because it involves children, but because of the pure violence involved. Your mother actually encountered Gregsby at the house, and she was injured herself. Right. You said that you didn't see her for several weeks. How 
how did anything else, how did this long term affect her? Did you see a change? Um, I mean, she was, she was never the same after that. I, I think the changes were more subtle than what I realized as an 11 year old. I mean, looking back on it now, uh, I, I see that the changes weren't as subtle as I, as I thought they were. Um, you know, she was never as spirited and um, joyful as she was before the murders, I guess is how I, I, is how I would put it. Mm -hmm. How about your father, if this could go actually to either of you, what, how did this affect him? <laughs> go ahead, Karen. You, you want to go first or you want me to? <laughs> no, you, you go first because I think our perceptions are probably going to be a little bit different. Yeah. Um, that, the murders ended our family dynamics as we knew it. Um, my sisters and I came in December right after the murders, and that was our last time in California. Oh, pictures were already gone of Scotty. There was, there was just nothing left of Scotty. It was like he just vanished into thin air. And I believe that's basically how our parents kind of, uh, there was no conversation about it. There was never any conversation about it. I've talked to my father recently. Um, I started talking to him again two years ago when I found out all of this because I had no idea that he was who had to go into that crime scene and identify my baby brother. I can't imagine having to see that. And I can't imagine Mary ever forgetting Robert Grisby's face. I think she probably saw that every time she closed her eyes, and I, I feel certain my father sees Scotty every time he closes his eyes. I, I would say, um, you know, obviously everything that Karen said is is both factual and correct. Uh, from my standpoint, um, again, you know, very subtle changes. Um, one thing was, I, I think he was much more protective, uh, you know, as a, as a father. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of this or not, but in July, after the trial, um, we moved to Montana. So I think that was his way of or thinking that he was getting us out of harm's way. So, um, I, you know, I, again, being 11 years old, um, I, I just see the, the, the subtle things. Um, I, I didn't really notice him necessarily being any more angry or having a shorter temper. Um, although, you know, I, I think in certain situations, um, I think he put his foot down in a protect in what he thought was a way of protection when he didn't necessarily have to. Well, everybody copes differently when it comes to True. grief. I've I've seen some people where after a loss they cling more tightly to their children, and for others it's it helps out of sight, not necessarily out of mind, but it hurts less. Right. And it's sure. something I heard yeah. from um, the Greenwood family itself. I was able to find several news articles where for the Greenwoods, you know, it was Mr. Greenwood, Mrs. Greenwood, and Adrian. And Mr. Greenwood's whole family was annihilated yeah. in one day in their own home. And he ended up moving away pretty soon after yeah. that yes. as well. Yes, he did. I, it's, it's my understanding that um, I don't even think he was around for the trial. I think he... he put the house on the market and I, I think he lived in England or moved back to England if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that is, that is something that I heard as well. That's, Let's. Yeah, that's what all of us have heard. And she, Linda Greenwood was pregnant. Oh my. So had this, if, if this 
was in today's time, that would have been four murders. He mor- he murdered four people because she was pregnant, wow. but he was only charged with three. Yeah, and let's let's talk about the trial and the sentencing a little bit. Your mother testified she identified Grigsby in court because she had such a close encounter with him where he actually attacked her with the same knives that he used on his other victims before he fled and was eventually caught at Hart High School by deputies. Something to know is that Grigsby was 17 at the time. He was wearing a neck brace because he had recently been in a car accident. And from what I had read, he pled not guilty. He insisted that he was innocent the whole time, that it was 99% a circumstantial case. Obviously, that we know that was not the case because a judge heavily disagreed and ended up sentencing him to three life sentences for murder, as well as additional time for your mother's assault. Do you remember any of that time? I doubt that you were at the trial, given what else you've said, but do you remember what it was like? Um, I, I don't. I, again, we basically were shielded, uh, not allowed to watch the news, not allowed to read the newspapers. Mm-hmm. Um, what bits and pieces that uh, we knew or found out about was uh, through my Aunt Kay, mm-hmm. my, um, my uh, father's sister-in-law. So, I mean, you know, I, I, I can remember my uh, mom and dad going to the trial every day. Um, but, I mean, you know, watching them leave and watching them come home, um, that was about it. And, and then again, when my mom came home, um, during that time period, she was back up in the room, and I didn't really see or interact with her. Mm-hmm. So this is for both of you. What what do you know about Grigsby? Like, what have you heard about him? What is your personal impression of him? And you guys can decide who wants to start on that one. Go ahead, Karen. Okay. Um, up until two years ago, my knowledge of Grigsby and the murderers was that he was 17 years old. He was pretty much fresh out of juvenile hall and that it was a burglary gone bad. And my baby brother was in the wrong place at the wrong time and was stabbed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Singular stabbed. And I knew another three-year-old and the other, the three-year-old's mother was stabbed. I had no idea anything beyond that. And I, I did know he was 17. I did know he was 17. Um, my cousin, Mark sent me transcripts from the trial, from Grigsby's hearings, his parole hearings, since he's been, uh, incarcerated. And I read those two years ago. Um, I was beyond horrified to find out that my baby brother's throat had been slit. So was Linda's. So was Adrian's. The the stab wounds were not a stick here and there. Uh, I want to say there were over 30 stab wounds on each of the three-year-olds, and I believe the number was 60-something on Linda. 67. And Grigsby went home from the murder scene changed out of his clothes, threw his bloody clothes in the washing machine, and went back to the murder scene. That was when he was caught. He went back and moved the bodies around. I only know this because of the, it's either the trial testimony or the transcript testimonies of the DA's office, the sheriff's department, and I think deputies. Mm Mm-hmm. That was not information that was public that I had read anywhere else. And it was real hard reading. I had nightmares for probably three to six months and would have to take something to go to sleep so that I could sleep because I just 
it was like I lost my baby brother again after reading a lot of this. Um, so I, I knew nothing of Grigsby. What I know now of Grigsby is he needed mental help, and he went without receiving that mental help. Um, we just do not do a good job at diagnosing mentally ill people in this world, and we do not take care of them once they're diagnosed. Uh, that doesn't undo what he did, but had he not slipped through the cracks the first time after bludgeoning the 16-year-old, then the other murders would not have happened. And I don't want him to slip through the cracks again. No, in entirely understandable. I'm just going to jump in here real quick. I'm actually holding in my hand a article from the Van Nuys newspaper at the time, which includes testimony from the psychiatrist uh, in his case. And what's very interesting is that um, he was found to have schizophrenia and had also recently experienced a head wound, which is something that has, in further studies, been shown, especially at a young age, to aggravate people who are already delicate and violent in that way. What was very interesting that I found during sentencing was that the judge actually said that he was not mentally ill. While technically, yes, he was not legally insane, I, I personally find the fact that the judge claimed that he was not mentally ill at all to be incorrect. Yeah. I, I would have to say yes on that also. One of my... Uh main questions to the parole board when they have the hearing in March is how could somebody that's committed these murders in the manner that they were committed um, not be mentally ill? I mean, I, 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 I'm, I have a college degree, but it's not in psychiatry. Or sociology or anything like that but I don't think someone needs to be that intelligent to figure out that you know Grigsby was there was something very wrong with him yes um, as during the course of my research here as you mentioned he had attacked actually his next-door neighbor right mm -hmm. that was she was asleep she was in her bed. He had apparently broken in. They said it was a burglary, but he very specifically attacked her with a hammer in her sleep and then went to a juvenile detention camp for six months, got out, and then committed a triple murder where he killed two, potentially three children and a young woman. Right. Yeah. He was supposedly coming, when he did the murders, he supposedly was coming from some visiting some counselor or somebody that he needed to check in with. And I read this somehow in these reports also, um, that he, it did not go well. Whenever he went, it did not go well. Um, something had happened at his job, and that may be where the neck brace came in, because he was in, involved in some kind of a wreck on his job that they found him negligent. Mm -hmm. And he... Grigsby has always blamed everything on somebody else. It is never him, never, ever him. Um, it's always somebody else's fault. Somebody else did it, you know, and he was he was walking home from this, and that's when he committed the murders. So during the course of, obviously, you read through this whole report, did Grigsby ever reveal a motive? I know during the course of the, the trial itself, he always claimed he was not guilty. Karen. No, the 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 only motive I know of was that he, whoever he met with, whatever counselor, or parole officer or whatever, that he had to check in with, that it went bad, and he was on his way home from that. So I don't know whether that triggered this rage, or I, I don't know. <clears throat> My perception, knowing what was discussed around me between. Um, my aunt and my uncle, of course, my parents never discussed anything about it, but between sneaking 
a peek at the newspapers and listening to my Aunt Kay and my Uncle Rodney uh, talk about it. Um, my, my understanding and perception at the time was there was definitely not a motive and uh, that he just happened to be passing uh, the Greenwoods house and because of his mental issues, something triggered him to, you know, commit the three murders. That's, I, I, I don't think, I, I mean, again, no given his, no one knew each other. yeah, given mm -hmm. his level of mental illness, um, I, I don't think anyone will ever know if there was a motive or not. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to say, you know, obviously none of us are, are mental health professionals here. We can theorize till the end of time, but sure. no one will really know except for him. Sure. Right. So, And he, he refuses treatment. Ah, <laughs> yes. Okay, I see. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, he, you know, he's, he's in the best place to get help, to get educated. Um, and from reading these different transcripts, they, you know, they tell him at, at, at I can't believe that his first parole hearing was in 78, but it, it, it was, and he defended himself. Yeah, which, for, um, which for context, for those listening, his first parole hearing was in 78. He was convicted in 73. Correct. So that was correct. And in July of 73. Right. So we're talking about five years after he is convicted of three counts of first degree murder and a consecutive sentence, the judge made sure of that, that he wouldn't serve those at the same time, a consecutive sentence for the assault of your mother, he I, was eligible for parole. Yeah, I, 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 I don't even begin to understand I, I don't how have that words works. For it. I, I, mean, I can't wrap my head around that I mean, at all. In a lot of states, you know, he would have been put to death without, I mean... A, a very uh, rapid, you know, path to the death, you know, to the death penalty in a lot of states. Correct. But for some reason, I'm not sure why. Well, that death penalty was removed in order for them to try him as an adult. I did read that as well. Mm -hmm. True. That's, I mean, again, I, with all the evidence that they had at the time, I, I, I don't even understand why why that happened. I don't either. But it did. Which, you know, we've, we've kind of mentioned early in this time, you guys have not had contact with him in any way. Have you ever attempted to try to contact him? I know you haven't stayed here. You're shaking no. your head. No, I haven't. How about you, Karen? No, I, I, I don't. I, I, um, I can come to the, the hearing and I struggle with even wanting to see him and put a face with the horrible things that he did. I don't, I, I don't even know that I could, I could do that. Yeah. So for, for those of you listening, you have to realize this, this crime happened in 1972. He was 17 at the time. He is currently 66 years old. In the grand scheme of things, that's, that's not that old. As a matter of fact, some people might even argue that's barely above middle age in today's. <laughs> in today's He's three day. years older than I am, so no, it is not very old. <laughs> so, how do you guys feel about this, knowing that he is eligible for parole and potentially could get it, and that you guys will have to continue doing this? Well, I'd rather continue doing this than having him, him get out get yeah. out and be out on the street and with his type of mental issues I, I don't even want to think what could possibly happen if he's if he's let out of, of out of prison and I, I'm gonna add to that the fact that he has issues with women um, when he went to uh, juvenile the juvenile camp he um, was making obscene phone calls to the nurse at the juvenile camp. He has also been caught uh, doing things with female guards around. Um, if he's released, my understanding is he's going to go to his sister's 
And I don't think that would be a good place for him. I, I wouldn't put it past him harming his sister. I really feel certain that before he committed these crimes and was caught, he had to have done something at his family earlier and prior because his brothers didn't even really come to his defense. I see. So Karen, you mentioned that you'd been to other parole hearings. What, when did you go and what was that like? No, no, no. I've not been to them. Oh, okay. I, oh you're speaking I in just, the future. Since I received I the transcripts from them, Okay. from my cousin who, or I guess he ordered them at a time that he could get all of that and he got it all for us. Okay. All right. So last time he came up from parole was in 2019 and he was denied for three years. He's next coming up for parole on March 22nd, 2022. What is your guys's plan for this? Whichever one of you wants to start. I'll, I'll start. Um, well, originally I was planning on going to the Chino Institution for Men, which is where he's being housed, and that's where the parole hearing was going to be. Uh, I spoke to someone, uh, a representative of the parole board, last Friday, and it's uh, they're they're holding all parole hearings um, via Zoom. So I I will I will be attending via Zoom, and um, like I said, I I have some pretty strong questions that I want to address or ask the parole board when we're, when that hearing is ongoing. And you, Karen? Um, I don't know whether I'm going to attend it uh, via Zoom or not. I didn't realize that until today when Stephen mentioned that. Um, I just know I don't want to go in person. I've already sent in my letter um, against him being paroled. And I have uh, gotten the help of um, parents of murdered children. They have a petition going, as well as my own online petition that I have through change.org that all you have to do is put in Robert Allen Grisby. The current uh, petition has a picture of our brother Scotty on it, the old one that I got together and sent in back in 2019 when they were trying to advance his parole. Um, I think I sent in 655 signatures and that there were more from uh, parents against murdered children. Um, that's, that's all I know really to do is to get as many signatures on that petition and if, I mean, if somebody lives in Valencia, that, what better reason than to do that? Because I know that Grigsby's sister has a business in that area, and if he's released to her, he will be working for her in that area. He will be right back in that area. Wow. Wow. So we, we've talked a little bit about the system itself and how there was – a little bit of confusion and questioning in terms of why certain decisions were made during the course of the trial, during the course of sentencing. As the families of murder victims, what is some of your opinion on the system itself? And I know I kind of asked you if you had any opinion on our current Los Angeles County District Attorney, George Gascon. I know he doesn't apply to either of you, but if you guys have any opinion on him, he's been well known to be quote unquote for the criminal because he has actually dropped bail for a lot of nonviolent felonies, which unfortunately can also include precursors to violent felonies and has actually led to an increase in gun crime and a whole lot of other things. Do you guys have any opinions you would like to share on the current policies or systems? Go ahead, Karen. Well, I can't vote on them. I wish I could. <laughs> Um, and I and I read over it, and just because somebody has served more than 15 years does not mean they need to be let out. On, and Grigsby falls under this. That's this is why this is so scary and so important. Um, and I even got a call this year from somebody at uh, the either well, it was in California. Part of the victims' rights mm -hmm. are for us 
and letting us know, made sure I got an email, I got a letter, and I got a phone call letting me know. So I really knew that this time this is really very important. And now that I know uh, the current district attorney's policies, I understand why, because Grigsby fits part of these. Um, he has served more than 15 years. He is above the age of 60. Risk of COVID, I don't know, but I don't really care. Um, and I doubt that anybody with the CDCR would recommend him for parole. Um, he's not a person of criminalized survivors. He came from a very white-collar college-educated family background. Um, he had good schooling. He had, I mean, you know, he's in an upper-middle-class neighborhood. He's not He's not poor. He's not uneducated. The only thing that he is in all of that that was listed in all of that is, yes, he is black. That's the only thing he is. Um, and, seven, and he's younger than 17. He was younger. He was 17 when he committed the murders. I think... Steve and I talked about it. I think his birthday is October. He turns 17, and a month later, you kill three people. And he went into prison because he was convicted in July, so he was 17 and turned 18, you know, that October. Mm -hmm. But the fact that he continued to do these crimes, I don't think he should be considered for any of these. And then as I read on, for resentencing uh, necessary to eliminate disparity, to promote uniformity of sentencing. The evidence is against him. Uh, his disciplinary records while he's been in there are against him. Rehabilitation, he has not been rehabilitated. He won't participate in any of that. Um, and positive programming while incarcerated, nope, he's not participating in any of that. So although he meets a lot of the criteria of who they're looking to let out, he also doesn't meet any of the criteria where he should be recommended for it, like evidence of time served and age and that it's diminished his physical condition or would reduce the risk. It doesn't reduce the risk of, of future violence at all. He would, I know, beyond a doubt, within the year being released, he would commit another crime. So that's my opinion. It was very good. Thank you. <laughs> Steve. <clears throat> as, I, as I said a little bit earlier, I don't understand how a judge didn't take his mental health and the psychiatrist's opinion into account at, at the time. Um, I, I'm fairly, fairly hard on crime as, as an opinion. Um, you know, I'm not that familiar with L.A. County, uh, you know, laws, especially the new district attorney, what, his, what he's trying to uh, legislate or what his opinions are. Um, again, I just, I, I don't understand how someone that's committed three murders in the fashion that he committed them could even be considered for parole after five years or 20 years or 30 years, especially when, again, he hasn't admitted to committing the murders and takes no responsibility for them. Very well said. So what can we do? What can our listeners do to help? There's the petition. Is there anything yeah. else that we can do? Write letters to the parole board. There you go. And as, as you mentioned, his sister owns a business in this area. So that is something that applies to our listeners here in Santa Clarita is remember that just because something happened, you know, 1972, obviously that was before I was born, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm sure there are still people in this area who remember this incident, who remember your families and who remember the way that this affected a community. We saw it recently with, we had a murder last year with Michelle Dorsey, who was murdered by her estranged husband and the community came together for that. And I would really suggest and encourage our listeners do the same for your family. And I hope that is the case. 
I really, really love you guys coming in here. Do you guys have anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? Go ahead, Karen. Um, well, I, I just, I, I hope, <laughs> I hope we can stop this. I truly do because in my heart and in my soul, I feel obligated as Scotty's sister to let this be known and for Mary and for our family and the other families that were affected by it, because Grigsby's family was affected by it as well. So was the rest of the neighborhood. I mean, you don't live next door and have something like that happen in your neighborhood, in your own backyard as such, and it not affect you and it not leave a mark on you. It's left a mark on our family. And I know that if he is released, it's not, if he will do something, it's when. I think that the more media attention that this gets, um, hopefully it'll uh, cause a snowball effect. Um, and the parole board will see how, um, not only how our family is and was affected, but also, um, you know, the community here, um, you know, what they're, what they think should happen and how they were affected. I'm certainly hoping that that's the case. Uh, for those of you who are listening, thank you so much for tuning in to KHTS and thank you so much, Karen and Steve, for joining me. This has been incredibly revealing for me and I know it's difficult for you guys and I really appreciate yes. that. Thank you. Thank you for having us, Jay. Thank you very much. Thank you. For those of you listening, thank you so much. You can listen on our website. You can also head on over to hometownstation.com. I will be putting up an article on this where you'll be able to find links to the petitions right there, and you'll be able to find all the information you need in order to try to have your voice heard on this situation. Thank you guys so very much. For more on this and all other local news, head on over to hometownstation.com. Your business sign is essential to getting customers to your location. Feathers can help.